So, I would love to ask you a question. When you hear the story of Easter, as we've heard in the poem from the children earlier, does it feel real or, or does it feel more like a fairy tale to you? The Easter story is a tale of hope, love and sacrifice and it's easy for us to hear this message once a year and consider it as we might a fairy tale if we're not careful. You see, when we were little children, I'm sure that most of us read fairy tales or saw Disney films uh, on television. And can anyone here tell me their favorite fairy tale or Disney film? So children, expecting some good answers and adults. Let's say what you've got. Robin Hood. Oh, that's a classic, that wasn't it? Go on. Tangled. I have actually watched that. My sister forced me to once. Uh, it was actually quite good. Yeah. Anyone else? The Lion King. Oh, he's seen my sermon. That's, my, that's mine. Uh, anyone else? Aladdin. Aladdin. Come on. All, all great, great films. Um, but yeah, my particular favorite, as I've said, was The Lion King. Um, I remember being moved to tears as a child um, when, spoiler alert if you haven't watched it, uh, Simba's dad sacrificed himself to save his son. And for years, uh, Simba blames himself for his dad's death until eventually he realizes that his evil uncle, Scar, was actually to blame. And at the end of the film, he confronts Scar and wins back his kingdom, claiming his birthright. It's a triumphant ending, a happily ever after type of ending. And the majority of fairy tales you know, usually finish in a similar sort of way. These stories often tend to go something like this. So the handsome prince married the beautiful princess. They had loads of children. And they live happily ever after. All the trials and tribulations in the story have been overcome and difficulties dealt with, any dragons slain. Now they can live in peace and harmony for the rest of their days. But when we look at the Easter story, we might be forgiven for reading it a bit like a fairy tale if we're not careful because Jesus suffered for us on a cross, died in the most painful way for you and me, and in doing so, he conquered death and fulfilled prophecies in rising again, he, he promised us a new start, a hope for the future. Um, uh, it's perhaps, I guess that's perhaps a simple summary of, uh, of what happened at Easter over 2,000 years ago. But it, you know, it follows a similar story arc in a way to that of a fairy tale. And the ending is a happy one, full of you know, fulfilled promises and slates wiped clean. But at this point in the fairy tale, we might want to close the book and put it back on its place in the bookshelf. We might turn off Netflix as we finish the film, so to speak. You know, in other words, we put it away, happy and hopeful, and we move on to the next thing, perhaps picking up that comforting and wonderful story again at some point in the future when we want comfort again. However, this is not the point of the Easter story. The resurrection of Jesus uh, was not a happy ending to close the book on. It was an invitation to a new beginning and a call to do something with the hope that we have now been given through Christ. And let's briefly return to a little earlier in the story for a moment, to the night before Jesus' crucifixion, a night where we can see human fragility so clearly in the person of Christ. You see, in both the Gospels of Luke and Matthew, we see Jesus described as being in such anguish at what is to come that he was praying prayers uh, such as, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And we also read that his sweat became like drops of blood. And interestingly, there's actually a name uh, for this. And some theologians consider uh, that Jesus might have experienced a rare condition called hematohydrosis, which is when you sweat blood and it can occur in someone who is under extreme levels of stress. It's considered that the sheer thought of the weight of the task at hand was so great that the stress alone would have killed Jesus had the angel mentioned in one of the Gospels that came to him not come and comforted him. They actually reckoned that he might have healed him uh, and intervened. And whatever the truth is here, hopefully this paints a picture of the context in which Jesus was crying out to the Father to take the cup, the burden, from him. You know, he was asking God to take this task away from him if it was his will. He didn't want to experience the bitter taste of death, and yet he knew he had to. And what we see here is Jesus showing a fear and a reluctance, just like you or I. 
Jesus' own words were, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He knows death is at hand and is fearful of the suffering he is about to endure. And Jesus was both fully man and fully God. He felt every inch of the pain and suffering we do as humans. But when Jesus died on the cross for us and stood in the place of our sin, he took on all of the pain and the suffering that we deserved, not him. He offered us a new way. He offered us a life with direct access to the Father, to have a relationship with God through his Son, Jesus Christ. But although, although this is uh, on offer to everyone here, it is something that we have to choose to accept. In order to live in the freedom and hope that Jesus won for us, we have to accept him into our own lives. We have to be willing to take the cup, as it were, willing to follow him, even when it might seem quite scary. The hope that is on offer is not freedom from every hardship and pain in our lives, but freedom to live through it with a saviour at our side, our comforter and our peace. Now the final thing that Jesus did before he died was to accept a drink of sour wine. And this was a symbolic act of him deciding to take the cup willingly, quite different to what we saw earlier in the Garden of Gethsemane. As soon as Jesus drinks this wine, he utters the words, this word in Greek. He says, tetelestai. And there was absolutely no doubt in anyone's mind as to what Jesus meant by this. This word would have been used uh, in a variety of different ways. A warrior might shout, tetelestai, as he drove a sword and killed someone with a final killing blow through someone's body. Or, or an artist, when they unveiled their final masterpiece, they'd pull the cloth away and they'd say, tetelestai, declaring that it meant, it is finished. Or a tax collector would write an abbreviated form of this on a bill or a receipt to mean paid in full. See, when Jesus said tetelestai on the cross, he was declaring that the hold of sin over our lives was finished through defeating death, the punishment that was required for our sin. He broke the system. And the debt that we owed to God, which was death, was paid in full as Jesus died for all of us, everyone here. Over the past couple of years, we've been partnering with local churches to support the work of an organization called CAP here in St. Austell. And CAP stands for Christians Against Poverty. And they're an organization who support with those who are struggling with debt, offering practical helps to enable them to become debt-free. And in an article describing the realities of living with mounting uh, and inescapable debt, they wrote this. They said, over the 21 years since CAP began, we've seen time and time again that poverty and isolation go hand in hand. People bury their heads in the sand, afraid to talk to anyone about what's going on, afraid of what others will think, convinced there's no way out. They became prisoners in their own homes, hiding behind closed curtains, terrified of a knock at the door or the sound of the telephone. Over a third of CAP clients say that debt made them afraid to leave the house, and one in ten were completely housebound because they were so crippled by fear. You see, the more isolated they became, the more that the debt built up. And the more that the debt builds, uh, the more isolated they became. And I wonder if this is how some of you are feeling here this morning. The things that you have been doing that have been wrong, and you know that they're wrong, and they've been building up and up and up in your lives. Perhaps you've been saying things to yourself like, how could God forgive someone like me? Or, I don't deserve anything. Or, what about, but I'm absolutely worthless, and no one even cares anyway. I want to tell you this morning that when Jesus hung on that cross and nails were driven through his skin, you better believe that he cared and you better believe that this paid for the debt that we have. He hung there for six hours in agony before he gave up his spirit and died. And on the third day, he rose again to glory. And so Jesus said that our debts have been paid in full. He shouted, Tetelestai, it is finished.
And he freed us from the crippling effects of a payment we could never make on our own. And now, now we have the choice to step out, to not hide anymore, and to live our life to the full in the freedom of what we are offered, cost-free. Unlike the fairy tale that ends with the close of a book and returns to the bookshelf to gather dust until we find we need it again, the Easter story ends with an invitation to be set free from everything that holds us back in life. 